welcome all of you and um, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be giving this presentation today and thank you for um, attending one of our first online trainings. Um, it's really exciting to be able to share uh, our information beyond our our area. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to doing more of this. So please look for more of our trainings as we um, as we move forward. Um, but today uh, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Elia Walsh and I'm the training director for uh, AANE. And uh, most of my responsibilities focus around training that is um, going on external to our physical location. So uh, we have in-house workshops that are wonderful and we try to bring uh, some of that content as well as other uh, information and consultation to outside organizations in um, in schools and other uh, other organizations. So um, that's my primary responsibility. I have um, our guest speaker today is uh, my son, Ryan, and he will be doing the second half of this um, presentation. So I will, uh, I'll have him say hello when we transition over that way. Um, but um, for now, uh, to give you a little background, um, my uh, background originally is in corporate training. Uh, I was a corporate trainer uh, for 12 years and um, I did management development and leadership development as well as professional development. So um, that was my original area. I uh, went back to school to become a teacher. I had a career change and um, loved it very much and ended up um, kind of focusing a little bit more on working with um, individuals that were on spectrum, students on spectrum. And um, after a year or so, uh, I realized that um, my son um, was, you know, having some similar symptoms and similar characteristics to some of the students that I'd been working with. And uh, it wasn't until several years later that he was actually diagnosed with PDD and OS. So, um, I guess that was probably why I, I loved working with um, those children so much. So uh, anyway, uh, from there, I moved from New York to Massachusetts and I worked um, a little bit here. I took the first year to transition my family. And then after that, I worked as a substitute teacher and I did a lot of leave replacements. And then um, I did teach first grade, third grade and sixth grade. So um, I've been in the classroom and I also worked as a paraprofessional um, filling in a little bit here and there as well. So I have a, a broad background and from there um, a position came from a and &E to be a director of training and um, they were looking for someone who had both a training background and an education background. So it uh, it seemed to be a really great fit, so I'm really happy to be um, in this place now. So um, without further ado, let's get moving with our training. We have uh, understanding students uh, with Asperger's syndrome and related conditions, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the, um, the artwork on the front here. Um, it's one of my favorite pieces. Uh, we have a, a gallery in uh, our offices in Watertown. And um, this was one of the pieces that I did fall in love with. So um, I wanted to use that. Um, Brian is um, an artist who has uh, AS and um, is, a, is a wonderful artist and is one of his, you know, part of his life career now. So if you wanted to see more of his artwork or some of the other artists, I, I'll show you another one later on. Um, you can visit our website and you can see the gallery from there. So today um, we're going to talk about what Asperger's syndrome is and related conditions, uh, areas that can affect someone um, with AS, uh, strengths and um, some challenges. And what does this look like at school? So, um, you know, my, just a little bit of a different take. We actually have a, a nice mixed audience here today. We have um, some middle schoolers, high schoolers. I know we have parents, we have educators, I mean, other professionals, and we also have grandparents on as well. So I'm very excited to share this information. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about it, what it looks like overall and then um, what it would look like at school. And then we'll take questions as we as we move along. So um, 
A quick question. What have you heard about autism spectrum disorders thus far? And we have a, a little poll feature here, and I'd like to actually post the poll. And when I um, when I launch it, if you could just take a, a second to just select as many as make sense to you. So um, here we go. I'll give you a few more minutes as it actually shows me how many people have voted so far. So I like to make sure we get a majority. Okay, so let's see what our results are. I can share those with you. And um, I see that uh, Ninety percent of you said it's a neurological condition, which yes, it is, and we'll talk about that um, in a couple slides. Um, I see you have AS is genetic. Um, research has shown that uh, autism spectrum disorders are genetic, so um, there are. I, I guess it's not to say that you might see the first line relatives around the individual, but uh, somewhere in there, it might be that someone was a little different or a little quirky or was set in their ways or something to that effect, um, but um, there is a genetic component. 95% of you said is considered to be part of the autism spectrum um, disorders, and 67 said is a developmental delay, and it is a developmental delay, but that's not to say that it's a delay in, in all areas. Um, there are various areas, and they can vary depending on the individual, so we will um, we'll touch on that in a few minutes. And then um, those with AS have many strengths and many areas of, uh, of, of challenges. So we will um, we'll talk about all of that as we go through. I just kind of wanted to get a sense of where you were all at and what you, uh, what you were aware of so far. So um, Asperger's syndrome is a neurodevelopment disorder affecting several areas of development where skills mask difficulties. So um, I guess one way to look at this is if you um, look at a, someone that's on spectrum or has Asperger's, one area might be um, really high. So for example, there might be uh, really high in language or they might be really um, high in uh, mathematical abilities. Um, but then there are these pocket areas where maybe they're very um, unorganized or maybe they have trouble relating to peers. And we'll get more specific into what that looks like. But I think the key piece here is that um, we call it an invisible disability because on the outside, um, these individuals look um, just like everybody else, there's nothing different about them. They are very intelligent. So um, sometimes that intelligence can mask some areas that they that they might have difficulty with. So someone might um, be really great at um, science, uh, for example, and then they might have trouble using a knife and fork, um, which are which is a huge gap. But yet, it kind one will kind of um, overshadow the other one. So we call that an, invis an invisible disability. I have a, a short video here. Um, it's actually uh, called Intricate Minds, and it's um, from the Coulter videos. And it's just a little snippet. Uh, but what I like about it is that it uh, it's it's given from the perspective of those that are uh, that do have Asperger's syndrome. So it'll just take me a second to switch here. Sometimes I just can't control what I say. Sometimes I say things without thinking. Then somebody says something funny. Usually everybody will laugh, but it's pretty hard for me to stop. I can never find the right words for the situations. It's hard. Quite a few times I actually get tormented and teased on a daily basis. I have trouble with the cafeteria. Everyone's uh, saving seats. You know, uh, me and my hundred friends are sitting here. The kids in school treat me like a background character. If kids at school got to know me better, they'd probably... Um, I'm getting the sense that you might not be hearing the video. Okay. Um, and the video is not showing up. 
Okay, so let me see if I can get this to uh, to play for you. I think I figured it out. Okay, so give me one second. AS is a kind of neurobiological condition where your brain is sort of wired differently. Oh, okay, I'm sorry that this isn't working. I thought that the video would be... Yeah. Okay, so um, I did try it before and it seemed to work, but it's it's not working now. But um, on the slides, I will actually be able to send you the link so you can watch. Um, so you can watch that, that piece. And... Um, hmm. I'm sorry about that. Let's see what we can do here. Okay, so I think we should be back to the correct screen now. I'm going to try that one more time. AS is a kind of neurobiological condition where your brain is sort of wired differently. Sometimes I just can't control what I say. Sometimes I say things without thinking. If somebody says something funny, usually everybody will laugh, but it's pretty hard for me to stop. I can never find the right words for the right situations. It's hard. Quite a few times I actually get tormented and teased on a daily basis. I have trouble with the cafeteria. Everyone's uh, saving seats, you know. Uh, all right, I tried one more time, but I guess uh, I guess it's not working. So I will um, I will send you the link to the video, so that way you can actually watch it. So sorry about that, but um, let's keep going. And so now um, we're going into. Uh, Asperger's syndrome being part of the autism spectrum disorders. And um, if you look here, the overarching umbrella as it is in the DSM-4 now is that Asperger's syndrome uh, is also part of the autism spectrum disorders, which also includes autism disorder, Rett's disorder, childhood disintegrative disorder, and pervasive development disorder, not otherwise specified. So uh, also known as PDD-NOS. Okay, so so one thing to keep in mind is when you've seen one person with Asperger's syndrome, you've seen one person with Asperger's syndrome. And this is a quote by um, Stephen Shore, who is an author, professor, musician, and adult with AS. And I guess the, the important thing to remember is that each person presents uniquely. And while we are going to talk about some um, generalities and some areas that are common for people who have Asperger's syndrome, each one can be very different. So um, if we go to, let's see, go to, this is the big picture. And I know um, if some of you have attended other workshops that we've presented, they, there's a, a larger version of this. And I tried to simplify it a little bit um, just to, for ease of presentation. So, um, in the center here, you have the person with Asperger's syndrome. And these are all the different areas that can affect someone with AS. And um, the first one I'd like to start with is a theory of mind or perspective taking. And um, if you think about how um, on a day-to-day -day basis, we think about how other people are, what other people are going to think and what their perspective is and um, how they're going to respond to something that we say, um, someone with AS might have some challenges in that area of really understanding where the other person is coming from. Um, and may oftentimes think that if they're uh, thinking a particular area that or a particular way or have a particular um, idea or paradigm that um, other people have the same the same you know thought process. Um, the next area is central coherence or generalization. And um, this is actually where someone um, will learn one particular skill um, and then be able to actually apply that to other areas. And an example I really like to use is that um, oftentimes, especially in a middle school setting where someone's just starting to change classes, they are in class and this particular teacher has a, a set of instructions. And I use a really easy one. Um, the example is, you know, before you ask questions, you must raise your hand. And that seems pretty, um, you know, pretty easy for, for most people. And 
they figure, well, if this teacher wants me to raise my hand, if I go to the next class, um, I should raise my hand there as well. Um, however, a, a child with AS might say, well, this particular teacher didn't tell me to raise my hand. And so that was, um, you know, my, my English teacher's rule and what the expectation is there, but that might not necessarily be what my math teacher's expectation is. So, um, so it is, uh, it is an area that, um, can be developed and can be built. So, um, you know, you start uh, taking a student and having them learn a particular skill in a particular area, perhaps the classroom, and then they need to take that skill perhaps home or to other areas. Um, so that's the generalization piece. The next piece is executive functioning um, and otherwise known as uh, organizational abilities or sometimes uh, in many cases lack thereof. And uh, my son, particularly, this is his area um, of challenge where he, he works the hardest at. And um, with executive functioning, this might be the student that um, the desk is overflowing or the locker, I like to say, is throwing up. And it might seem intuitive to just tell a student, you know, you need to clean your desk or you need to clean your locker. And, um, you know, a typical student might understand, say, okay, yes, I have to actually go through my papers and sort them and figure out where everything goes. But um, a student on spectrum might look at that and say, wow, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know how to begin to sort these papers. I don't even know um, what that process would look like. So we'd really need help uh, to be able to uh, go through that process of organizing. Um, this also goes into the area of uh, assignments and tasks and getting work done. So if you have a student that is um, needs to get a homework assignment, and one of the examples we often use is uh, one doesn't realize that when you tell a student uh, it's time to do homework or, you know, here's your homework assignment, the number of steps that actually go into completing a homework assignment. So first, the student needs to be able to hear the assignment or record the assignment down properly, and sometimes that's two or three steps. Um, and then once they have it down, they need to make sure that all the materials that they need for that assignment are put together. And then once they're put together, they need to make it to the backpack. From the backpack, they need to make it home. Once they get home, then all the pieces need to come out. And then once they come out, then you have to actually begin the assignment. And that's assuming that the student um, is able to complete the assignment uh, and that there's not a challenge in the actual work. Once the assignment is complete, then all those uh, all those materials need to get put back in the proper folder or the proper binder. Um, the books need to all go back in the backpack. The backpack needs to make it to school. All those items then need to come out of the backpack and then be able to hand them in. So this challenge can increase once um, the student hits middle school and high school as they have more teachers. Possibly each teacher has a different set of requirements um, of how they want things handed in. And so um, this particular area is definitely one that's seen in school um, as, a, as a challenge. And, and again, it can, it can uh, translate to uh, science uh, labs, um, other types of project work. Um, so moving on to social communication. Uh, this is another area where students are affected um, greatly, not just um, at home, but at school, and uh, particularly in the peer piece. So we have, under social communication, we have verbal and nonverbal communication. And um, I, I believe there's a recent, uh, a recent number that we, we looked at just a couple of weeks ago was 87% uh, of our communication is actually nonverbal, which means it's coming from looking at facial expression, um, body language, how we stand, how we move our hands, um, how we move our eyes. Um, and, and I'm sure we're all familiar with looking at our own uh, children or other family members and they roll your, their eyes and you, you kind of get the sense that they're, uh, they're uncomfortable or they're upset or they don't want to do what you're asking them. Um, for someone who's on spectrum, that might not translate the way, um, the way other people would interpret that. Um, an example I like to use is um, sometimes when my son, I, I'll say to him, uh, you know, Ryan, um, we need to do something. Or maybe I just call his name and I say, Ryan, 
he'll sometimes interpret that as that I'm yelling at him, depending on how high my voice is or how loud or the tone. And sometimes if I say Ryan, he might not get that maybe that's the voice of, you know, oh, I better pay attention because I think she, she might be a little bit annoyed with me. So, um, so that's one piece of the social communication. This also um, can be difficult when they're interacting with peers and um, maybe not even know how to approach peers, um, how to start a conversation, um, not be able to read the signal back. You know, am I standing too close? Am I not? Should I be further, further away? Um, can I fit into this conversation? So, um, again, that's mixing those verbal and nonverbal cues to know what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And I think this is a challenge area for, for many people. And also, um, as a teen, it can be particularly difficult for, for most teens. Um, but for uh, students with AS, they... Um, they oftentimes can have even more of a struggle because they're not really sure if they're reading the cues properly or if they're understanding um, the language that's coming to them properly. Um, so next, uh, moving on to sensory sensitivities. Um, this is an area of, uh, there's, I like to think of it as the five senses. So um, a person with AS uh, has all these senses very heightened or sometimes they're very dulled. So, for example, um, sometimes the sensation of being hungry, for example. Someone with um, uh, a spectrum disorder might not really get the signal that they're hungry. And so, um, you know, can go for hours and hours without eating. They might be uh, involved in, in a task or at work and never get that cue sensationally through their body that they're hungry. So they will forget to eat. Um, another is uh, sound. So sounds can seem twice, three times as loud as, uh, as a typical peer. So for example, um, in a classroom, I had a student that, um, you know, would try to do work independently and, and quietly. And he kept saying to me, what's that noise? What's that noise? I hear that noise. And I, and I would say, you know, which noise is that? And, and actually it was the light bulbs. I don't think they have light bulbs like this in schools anymore, but the light bulb, the fluorescent bulb, I think it's fluorescent, that would be in the ceiling made a, a slight humming sound. I guess it was starting to burn out and he would notice, um, that that was, uh, that that was making that humming and was distracting him from staying on task and doing his work. And those are things that most people wouldn't hear um, and just, uh, you know, or maybe hear it and kind of move past it. I also uh, like to use the example of the heat in the classroom. Sometimes in older schools, the heat makes noise and uh, that can be distracting. So you can imagine someone trying to take a test or trying to, you uh, complete a writing assignment and then they're they're distracted by the sound enough to keep them off task whereas other people might be able to um kind of stay uh you know either ignore it or really not notice it and and keep moving um smells is another one um particularly in schools we have the cafeteria which you know can be a, a mix of, of scents and smells and you know for some people that might trigger trigger hunger and for some people it might trigger what is that awful smell because it's going to make me sick and um i have a, a a friend whose son uh, is actually 18 and he um, he tried to work at a Burger King and he has um, he has Asperger's as well. And, you know, at first she was excited that he got the job. But um, on the flip side, she said, you know, he really can't stand the smell of food, especially fast food. So he was trying to get the job, but um, actually being there and with all the smells, not to mention all the other um you know, sensory activity that's going on in a, in a fast food restaurant. Um, it, it didn't work out. So he tried for one day, but, but it didn't work. So, um, that's another piece. The other piece is, um, touch. Um, and, uh, I have, uh, my brother who's probably has never been diagnosed, but I would say is, um, is also on spectrum. Um, he does not like to be hugged. 
So, uh, for him, I, I can hug him, but I have to kind of prep him before I do that. And, um, sometimes I can give him a kiss and then kind of go in for the hug. Um, but oftentimes it'll be, you know, just left at the kiss and, and move beyond that. Um, so hugging is not his thing. And on the other hand, uh, my son who, um, likes hugs, but sometimes, oftentimes, likes very tight hugs. So he likes that pressure. And, you know, we'll, we'll try to reciprocate the hug, but sometimes the hug is, is really tight. So we have to say, you know, okay, all right, that's good. That's good. A little lighter for us. Um, so that can be another piece of it. So that's the sensory um, area. And then another piece, um, as we move on, there are more uh, attributes that I like to talk about. Um, some are motor skills. So we have gross and fine motor skills. So gross skills are all, uh, gross motor skills are all those large muscle groups. So like running and jumping, um, and doing a lot of physical activity that oftentimes is expected, um, in, you know, in phys, uh, phys ed class. Um, the other is fine motor skills. So sometimes there are issues with, um, with writing or opening zippers and putting on jackets and opening backpacks and lunch boxes and things like that. Um, so those can be a challenge. Um, again, all of these can be developed um, and it just takes a little bit more time than their typical peers. Processing speed. Um, I like to think of this as, and, and uh, when I, I gave this presentation to high schoolers and I used the computer analogy, whereas most people think of processing speed is how fast my computer uh, is working. And in a way, I think of it kind of the same way, whereas, um, you know, sometimes if you put too much information into your computer, the processing speed slows down and then sometimes it just stops working. Um, and I think with uh, someone with AS, it can be very similar. Um, they're taking in tons of information and trying to process it as fast as they can, but sometimes it kind of stops um, or slows down. So it, again, it might take um, a student with some processing speed or slower processing speed, um, longer time to actually complete assignments and, um, you know, might need that extended time to, uh, to get it done. Um, difficulty with self-advocacy. Sometimes um, a student with AS will not know that it's okay to ask, um, you know, to advocate for themselves or to ask um, a teacher or a, another authority figure for, um, for assistance or for clarification. Um, they think that sometimes they should already know that, or sometimes they don't know to ask. They don't, maybe, they, maybe they're not aware that that's an area that they need help with, or they think maybe I'll figure it out, or maybe I do know it well enough. Um, so this is a skill that definitely is one that needs to be developed, um, uh, through the middle school, high school years so that, um, an individual with AS can actually be able to do this regularly by the time they're independent and on their own so that they can ask for what they need and they can, um, you know, get all the, the services or accommodations or just be able to maneuver and navigate through, um, through their needs as they get older. Uh, regulation of attention and impulses. So, um, oftentimes, uh, it's hard if, if they're having all this stimuli come in. So I, again, I think back to that student in the classroom who, you know, is hearing all the noise or is getting a heightened sense of anxiety. And then they actually have like the, the fight or flight response. So they, they might, um, just leave because they get over anxious or there's too much going on in the room for them. Um, so, uh, one example of that actually is, um, when we were, we were actually in Disney in, um, uh, not Disney, we were in SeaWorld and we had a relative that was very ill. It's my, it was my father-in-law and, um, we actually got news while we were away that he had passed away. And, um, I remember the anxiety level getting really high and my son not knowing how to respond to that information. Um, he fled. He actually, and it's not something he had done often, but he actually, ran and hid um, and we had to pull him out so that we could, you know, kind of collect ourselves. So while, while um, maybe a little bit of an extreme example, it's one that I can recall. Um, and I've had other students um, leave the classroom because it, 
the work just became overwhelming and, um, you know, the, the demands in the classroom became overwhelming. So they actually just leave the classroom. Um, and again, it's, it's their response to all of the, um, all of the input that's going in. Uh, flexible thinking, or in this case, sometimes maybe inflexible thinking. Um, also, you could say maybe black and white thinking. There's really this sense of there are a certain set of rules and, um, we need to stick to the rules all the time. Um, and, and most times that's good, but that can also lead to not being able to see other ways of thinking or other people's perspectives, or that there might be more than one way to accomplish a task or to go about doing something. Um, so uh, sometimes our kids need you know, coaching on that area. Another piece is perfectionism. Um, many kids on spectrum are very detail oriented and can really pick out um, fine detail and can remember it and know what things have to look like very specifically. Um, but when they're trying to accomplish a task on their own, they get so focused on that uh, task having to be perfect and fit exactly into the model they have in their mind that it makes even starting the task difficult. So um, they might not see, um, an another example is I had a student that would have me um, draw things for him whenever um, he would do accomplish work. So he loved trains. And so Thomas the Tank Engine specifically, so if anyone's familiar with that. And I would uh, draw a train for him whenever uh, he completed an assignment. Now, the tricky part was I can draw pretty well, but sometimes it wasn't the exact shade of blue for Thomas, or it wasn't the exact shade of gray, um, or, you know, I, I put a, a smokestack in the wrong place. And so there was that great attention to detail, um, but of course, uh, it wasn't exactly perfect. So you can imagine that student applying that to their own um, expectations of themselves. Another piece is predictability and routine, desire for sameness. So um, I have this picture here of this little boy sleeping with all of the stuffed animals lined up and the little rubber duckies. Um, and the reason why I chose this is because it reminds me of my brother when he was oh, probably about six or seven, um, when he would go to sleep in the evening, he had all these little... Um, Beanie Babies that he would tuck to the at the bottom of his bed. Now they had a specific order they had to go to bed in. Um, there was a specific way they had to be tucked in, and if they weren't in that order, there was no going to bed until until they were all put in that in their place. So I, I found it um, it reminded me of him, and I think it's part of that. Um, need for routine, need for stability, need for predictability, and so uh, while Routine and predictability can be a great way for our kids to um, find structure and feel safe. Um, life is not always predictable and life does not always have routine. So um, we need to build in some flex flexibility in there as well. And given all of the things that I've talked about thus far, um, kids on spectrum can be prone to anxiety and depression. And that's not to say most uh, teenagers are. Um, but there's a lot more being added onto their plate. So I heard someone once say that um, a typical person on spectrum, when they are um, their baseline anxiety, I believe a typical person's baseline anxiety is maybe somewhere between a two and a three. Someone on spectrum can run between six and seven, and that's on a, a scale of one to 10. So um, one of the things they, they need to do is make sure that they uh, find ways to regulate that anxiety and find ways to, um, to ease that down. And we'll talk about that in, in a few minutes. But uh, all of these can also lead to exhaustion and what many of us refer to and are very familiar with, which are meltdowns. So um, hopefully uh, we can show our our children how to regulate that. And um, we'll talk about some of the ways that they do, um, you know, regulate their feelings and self-soothe. Other attributes, normal to very high intelligence, um, particularly uh, good verbal skills, which include a really rich vocabulary, um, honesty and sincerity. Um, one thing is you will always know where you stand 
uh, with someone with AS. They are very honest, um, maybe sometimes a little too honest, but um, they expect the same thing from you. So they expect honesty and sincerity. Um, they have a strong sense of justice, of right and wrong, and uh, always looking to make sure that things are fair. Um, attention to detail, as we mentioned before, and, and coupled with that is uh, really keen senses, and that makes them really great observers. And so they might pay attention to details and observe things that most people won't notice, which um, can also be really good life skills and also could be really good career skills, depending on um, the direction that uh, that they go in. Um, there is uh, coding is a really uh comfortable area for many people with AS in that um, they can either find a lot of the errors. Um, they can also do a lot of testing, you know, computer testing. I'm not, I'm not techie that way at all, but, uh, but I know people who are working in that area now and they're really good at finding where the mistakes are, uh, finding where the flaws are, or making sure that it's written in the, um, in the right way, make sure the coding is, is perfect as it needs to be. A sense of humor and oftentimes maybe a little bit of a off color or different uh, type of, of sense of humor um, because they see things differently. They think of things um, outside of the box, as I have listed here later on. Um, so the humor can be uh, can be wickedly funny sometimes. Um, deep interest. And we'll talk about special interest in a minute. But these deep interests, um, they can become real experts in their area, which can lead to future careers. So, um, you know, don't, uh, don't put aside sometimes some of their, uh, deep interests, which can actually really become something that becomes a passion for them and a love, uh, and, and work in the future. And originality and creativity, thinking outside of the box, again, um, being able to see things differently and possibly come up with a different perspective that other people hadn't thought of. So, um, so these are some more areas. And special talents and interests. Um, one thing is memory for facts, as I talked about before. Um, another area of interest could be music, art, um, other sorts of talents. Uh, I have uh, one student that um, plays five instruments, and he's very talented at all of them, um, is in theater and uh, sings, and what he would like to do is um, – Really become uh, go to Juilliard is his is his uh, is his dream, um, but it is his life, and he really oftentimes puts aside other things just to focus on on his music. But but it is what makes him talented, um, and it will be a career for him, I'm sure. Um, attention to detail, as we talked about before, superior focus. Sometimes they can get really locked in on something and will spend hours and hours on it, um, which you know for a lifelong career can be can be awesome. Um, and also computer skills, as I mentioned before. Here's another uh, artwork piece um, by John Williams and uh, another one that I that I just really loved. You can also see his other work on our uh, on our website in the gallery section. Some other special talents and interests, some of you online might be familiar with some of these, and I know I'm missing lots of them, but these are just some of the ones that I, I wanted to put up to uh, appeal to a, a wide audience. Um, but these interests, again, can become uh, something that really helps to um, – soothe the anxiety and help regulate emotion. It can be what they use for a break as long as it doesn't, um, you know, take over their life. So in other words, playing uh, a video game or reading about cars or playing your instrument um, can be great, but it shouldn't overtake the important things in life, such as, um, you know, hygiene or eating or sleeping um, or schoolwork or other important tasks that are necessary to, uh, you know, to living a healthy life. Um, but they are a way to be able to, you know, de-stress and relax and then have that downtime so that you can get back to being on task. Friendships, um, building friendships can be challenging, um, 
And uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, missing some social cues, both verbal and nonverbal, um, having trouble initiating that conversation. I, many times when children are younger, um, I remember working with several three, four, five-year-olds, and uh, we did have to script their conversation and you know, tell them to introduce themselves and say, hi, my name is Adam. And, um, you know, say, hi, what's your name? Um, oftentimes children uh, who are diagnosed later uh, when they're older, maybe never had that, um, uh, that sort of intervention so that they were able to learn those skills. And then therefore, as, uh, as let's say nine or 10 or maybe even 12 year olds, it becomes much more difficult, um, but still a necessary skill in how to um, actually make friends may talk too much about their special interests. So what happens is they get really focused on talking about Pokemon. And therefore, um, sometimes when they're trying to make friends, they use that as a way to have a conversation. But then it becomes so focused on that topic that their the friend or the, the other peer that they're trying to make friends with loses interest or is kind of bored because they're only talking about themselves. And so therefore really don't want to continue having that um that conversation. So, um, yeah, so focusing on special, special interests is also an area, um, that many children get bullied on because of maybe their special interest seems to be too young for their age, or perhaps it's something that most people aren't interested in, or it, it appears different or strange to, um, to their peers. So it is an area that the person might get picked on about. Um, Someone can be really rigid and then therefore making friends can be difficult. Um, they're not able to see the other person's perspective. They're not able to really um, uh, flex their way of thinking so that they can play in a, uh, a larger group or interact with a, with their peer. And sometimes lacking a social filter. Sometimes they might say something that is not meant to be offensive, but then comes off as being offensive. And so, um, you know, someone else might feel that they're being, um, that, you know, they said something that was personal and they take things a little personally and the person who's speaking didn't mean it that way. So, uh, so sometimes, you know, having to explain to the, to this child, you know, um, sometimes you have to say things a certain way and, um, and sometimes that's hard to convey that message, but, that it might hurt somebody else's feelings or that they might not want to speak to them. Um, sometimes that can help kind of um, add that little bit of filter and may have anxiety about how to behave. And I have may have anxiety, but I'm going to say they do have anxiety about how to behave, um, not especially given different situations. So how do we behave in one situation versus another with this person versus that person with a teacher versus another adult with my parent um, versus a significant other. Uh, so there's, there's lots of variables and we, we might not realize that we have to behave differently sometimes with, with those that we interact with, depending on who they are. Um, and that can be hard to kind of uh, separate out to figure that out. And I did have another video, but I'm not going to try playing it, uh, which is the friend algorithm. Um, and I don't know how many of you are Big Bang uh, Theory fans, but um, I often find uh, many of our of our uh, of the people in our community really love the Big Bang Theory. But um, if you get a chance, again, you'll have the slides, so you'll be able to link to the friend algorithm and. Um, it's really uh, Sheldon taking you through um, a, a pathway of how to make friends. And he, he's convinced that that would, if he follows these steps, that he'd be able to find and make friends. And, uh, and if it were only that easy, I'm sure we'd be able to package it. But, uh, but unfortunately, it's not that easy. So given um, some other situations that you might encounter in school, how would someone with an ASD experience um, these particular things? So in a classroom setting, you can imagine there is lots of noise, rustling of papers, books, pencils, clicking of pens, um, people just talking or sometimes even in those first few minutes before a period starts and when it ends the amount of noise in that transition um, can be off-putting and um, I mean here we have a classroom where there's clearly no supervision um, but oftentimes there might be a situation that can be very loud and almost 
this situation, which might not really be like this, could actually look like this to someone with ASD, where the, the classroom feels like it's very out of control because there's just so much going on. I believe the same is true for the cafeteria. And, um, you know, there's the added level of needing to choose where to sit to eat and um, who do I eat with? Do I buy lunch? Do I bring lunch? Um, am I going to like what it tastes like? Sometimes there's a lot of sensory issues around food um, as far as taste and texture. So that that alone can be stressful, as well as the smells um, of being in the cafeteria. So um, there's a, another level there. We also have free time or unstructured time. So I see this in the elementary school as a recess or the, the playground um, where sometimes just one student actually said to me, it would it's difficult to pick what thing to play on. There are so many choices. So there's the slide, there's the swings, um, there's the little rock climbing piece. Do I go run around with the other kids on the field? And so just the choice of which item to choose is difficult. And then if you have to wait online for one of those items, then that can be an additional challenge because the impulse is to just go down the slide. But now you have to wait in line to go down the slide. Um, another area is things like uh, study periods. Um, and I know so there are structured studies and unstructured, um, but as far as the, the study where um, a student has you know, 40 minutes or so to manage their time to either get work done, you know, can be a very challenging time on, well, what do I focus on first and how do I structure that time? Uh, so um, the same is true for vacations or uh, after school time where they don't have an activity or homework. Um, so again, that can be um, difficult as well. So physical education, um, there can be concerns about being uncoordinated um, or not really understanding rules of a game um, or how they fit into those rules or, you know, those kind of issues. And I, I would think physical education and extracurricular activities kind of are, are similar. Um, so the, the challenges would be would be very similar there. So um, I'm, at this point, if you have any questions you would want to, I see a, a, a hand raised, and I haven't been able to actually look through the chat because I've been speaking, but I see a couple people with their hand raised. If you could, I don't know if chatting in the question would work. Um, so I just want to make sure, is the chat, someone had mentioned that the chat function might not be working. So I'm going to type in something and see if Okay, so the chat function is working. I have a couple of raised hands. So actually let me um I'm going to un unmute um our first question. So I think that that would be for Marilyn. So let me unmute Marilyn and then if you could ask your question. Okay, go ahead. Hello. Uh, maybe Marilyn is not there. Hello. Okay. All right. So I can't hear Marilyn. Let's try Anne. I believe Anne has a question as well. So let me ask Anne. Okay, I don't have Anne on either. Okay, any other questions so far? Okay, so what I'd like to do is um, turn it over to Ryan, and uh, he'll be able to. I, uh, he'll, he'll be able to start his presentation. So before I move on to him, um, does anybody have any, uh, questions that they wanted to chat in?
So I had a question, um, can we get copies of the slides? Yes. So what I'll do is I will um, email a copy of all of the slides so that you have access. And you should also in there have a link to the um, the videos. And um, I believe we'd also have, uh, we would have a file of the chat session. So if anyone was interested in in that, I could send that as well. So I had a question here about how to learn how to coach the needed skills. And I'm not sure I, I understand if, uh, if you can clarify a little bit more what you're thinking. I have another question. What is the difference between AS and nonverbal learning disorder? Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily an expert on nonverbal learning disorders, so, um, but um, I believe there are very similar, there are commonalities. So actually we, we talk about um, related conditions, not just the ones that are covered right now under the DSM-4, but also um, nonverbal learning disabilities. So I would say I, I really can't accurately tell you what the difference is, um, but I know that there are a lot of similarities and a lot of the strategies we use with um, with our AS population uh, also are helpful to those students with uh, nonverbal learning disorder. So I have another question here. AS kids have these skills they need to learn and many of us want to help, so we need to learn how to help them develop skills or strategies. So I guess I'm asking, uh, from what I get from this, there are two questions. One is really identifying what um, what those skills are. And then, um, then once you know what those skills are, uh, to apply strategies to help them. So I think first of it, first of all, it's being able to um, identify what those skills are. And, and again, for each for each person, it's going to be different, and I think a lot of it is um, is really just trial and error. Is just sitting and seeing um, what areas are they having difficulties. Is there a a pattern of not being able to hand in homework? Is it not necessarily just not being able to hand in homework? Is it that they don't know how to copy the assignments down? Um, and then from there, you can actually start seeing what the strategies are for that. Um, and the same would be true with um, social interaction. So if a student is having difficulty with social interactions, you'd have to kind of delve down deeper into um, what pieces are they having uh, difficulty with? Is it initiating conversation? Is it maintaining conversation? Is it that they feel really comfortable with family and close friends, but then making new friends is difficult? So again, it's really teasing out what each one of those pieces are, and that would be on a case-by-case -case basis. So I have two more questions here. Uh, another is, are medications useful in dealing with AS? Um, you know, there's really no one particular medication that you could say, you know, give a, give someone this and it's going to make AS all better. Um, there are many people who use different medications for different um, symptoms and behaviors that fall under AS. So for example, um, many people with AS have difficulty sleeping. So some do take medication to help them sleep. And that would be something you would really have to talk to um, a specialist, uh, you know, a medical professional that preferably specializes in people on spectrum because, um, you know, treating someone on spectrum um, looks different and can be very different than treating someone that's typical. So you want to make sure that uh, if you give a particular medication, it might not offset other areas that would become more challenging. Um, so the next one, is it common for a person with AS to have mood disorder as well? So, um, you know, that would be a, a, like a tangential additional diagnosis, but it is common to see that. So that's, uh, 
that's just a quick answer. Um, what, another question, what is the best way to get the school to help a child to blossom with AS? For example, I know my son, my son Ryan, uh, he is getting mediocre grades, but he's so intelligent. Yes, um, I am familiar with that scenario. And I think it takes uh, a lot of effort on all the people who work with the child. So um, many times that's, in my experience, it's the parents that have to really push through on that. But then um, also really focusing on what their strengths are and what are the areas that they're uh, really good in and being able to to use that um, to offset, you know, the struggles in school. So, um, you know, and it might not be in school sometimes. It might be outside of school. So um, as you'll hear my son talk about in a little while, his passion is music. And so we try to give him as many experiences with music as possible so that he can flourish in that area. Um, so sometimes I think it's it's not just what can the school do, but unfortunately it'll have to, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, um, it's going to be other avenues. And one more question here before we move on. You can coach a child or you can discuss the issue to look at coping ideas or you could model, are they all methods to try? I'm just thinking for one second. Yeah, I think they are all different models to try. And I think it's making, it's, it's deciding, um, which one you try first and then seeing how that goes. And then is it working? Is it not, if it's not working, if it's not working, then, you know, try something else. And, and oftentimes it is a, a bit of trial, uh, trial and error and seeing what works for each child. And again, what might work for one child, um, might not necessarily work for, for another one, even within the same family. So, um, so it is, it is a bit of, uh, focusing on the individuality of the child. Okay, so I think um, that was the last chatted question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch it over to uh, to Ryan. And um, so if you could just hold on for one second, I'm going to switch presentations. And then Ryan is going to have access. Okay, so I'd like to introduce to you um, my son, Ryan, and, um, and he's on. Oh, uh, hello. Okay, I see that everyone has audio now. Um, my name is Ryan Walsh. Um, as my mom has explained, I'm a student at St. John's High School in Shrewsbury. Um, and... I just want to give you a little bit about your about my life with Asperger's and about how I go about my daily life and how it kind of affects me. So we're just going to move right along. Okay. Um so a couple things about me. Um I love to uh I love to present. I love to be on stage. I love to talk to to uh, groups of people like this. It's a great thing for me. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just getting used to the... Uh, I'm getting used to web conferences, so uh, bear with me. Um, yes, I'm in 
theater. I, I've been in plays. I've been on stage before. Um, so really talking is a, is a pa- talking in front of, uh, groups of people is a passion for me. Um, um, so moving right along, I'm going to talk about the academic and, uh, social aspects of my life. The first thing we're going to talk about is academics. So there are really three parts of uh, academics that I really want to talk about today. And um, that's, the exec- that's the executive functioning, the fine motor skills, and uh, my ability to accept authority in the classroom or with the deans and stuff like that. Um, so the first piece we're going to talk about is executive functioning. So basically, um, executive functioning is like a major process that sends signals to all the other processes in the body, like your nerves and your um, ability to separate things and your ability to process steps. Um, so right here is what sh- is some of the functions that executive functioning governs and um, what's good about it and really what's not that good about it. Um, what I'm really good and what I'm really good at is especially this helps in like English class and history classes is um, my critical thinking skills, my memory for fine detail, I have a really good long-term memory and my verbal skills are very good as I'm talking to you all right now. Um, this makes it really good for me to um, get points across, especially in my writing and in my uh, verbal presentation. Um, really what's not that good, and it really affects my ability in things like math and in science, um, my organizational skills are really not that good. I had a tutor over earlier today, and she was talking about how my binder was falling apart and about how my backpack had papers in it, and it, it, it's just it's not, it's not a good thing to look at, okay? Um, my working memory, working memory is another term for, um, is another term for a short-term memory. So, for example, in all my classes, I have to write down my assignments, and I have to make a lot of notes and I have to pay a lot of attention in classes or else I'll forget really important details, especially if the detail is not written down. So if a teacher says something verbally and doesn't write it down on the board for me to write down in my agenda, I'm going to miss that detail. And it's really important that I make note of everything that might get lost in my short-term memory. The next thing, and this is what really ma- impacts math and science, is my ability to break down problems like math problems and um, and uh, scientific problems is to really um, is to really is the ability to break them down and to um, and is the ability to process the steps and the ability to put them together in a way where I can solve the problem. Um, another thing that's really good is a, which is a function of executive processing, is um, I'm really good at noticing what other people are doing. I'm really good at paying attention to the detail of how other people are and how other people act when they go about things, whether it be a conversation or school or homework. What I'm really not as good at, and I'll explain a little bit more of these two things later when I get to conversations, is monitoring what I'm doing. I'm really not that good at moderating what I'm doing. I'm not that good at seeing what type of messages I'm sending, and I'm not really that good at um, managing all of that.
Okay, so, uh, sorry about that. Just some technical difficulties on this side. Um, another thing I have an issue with is accepting authority. So, as you can see here, a teacher has to hold this set of animals to a certain standard. So this can be used as a metaphor for what it's like for me in the classroom. So every student in a classroom setting is held to a certain set of uh, is held to a certain set of standards, and is held to a certain set of ideas that they have to meet. So clearly, an elephant's not going to climb the tree as well as the monkey, and the monkey is not going to climb is probably going to climb the tree much better than the fish, who really can't climb a tree at all. So it's just like that in our situation. It's just like that in my. Um, can you see the slides? I'm seeing that you guys can't see the slides. Hello, I'm just trying to moderate the um, the slides here. I'm noticing that the slide didn't change for you. However, on the main equipment it did, and so I'm going to have to see if I can um, relaunch the presentation. So um, give me one second here, and I'll see if I can... Okay. Ah, I think we're back. So let me pull up his presentation again. And I think we're good to go now. Okay. There we go. Sorry, I uh, apologize for all these issues. Um, anyway, so I'll, I'll start for this slide from the beginning. So here you see a teacher holding these animals to a certain set of standards. This can be used as a metaphor for what it's like in the classroom, for me and for probably with other kids on spectrum. Um, so here there's an elephant and a monkey and a penguin and all this stuff. A monkey is obviously going to climb the tree better than an elephant and better than the fish who really can't climb a tree. So it's exactly like that in my it's exactly like that in my situation. All the people who are monkeys who can really just do it well, who are kind of the A student type of people, who can just kind of who can who have the ability to register information they don't have issues with executive func they don't have issues with executive functioning like I do they don't have they don't have to worry about the fine details and there are a lot of things that hold me back this might put me in the position of the elephant of the or the fish who probably can't climb the tree this might work in a situation like a state test which is one of the reasons I went to private school I had to get out of the state test um uh, so this really makes me frustrated with teachers and it makes it really hard for me to accept what they have to tell me especially if I don't agree with what a teacher is telling me or with what a teacher says I have to do because what a teacher might think I have to do I might not think I have to do it so sometimes I might just not do it and sometimes I might just have to learn how to deal with these things that are put me in the situation of the elephant where it's really hard or put me in the situation of the fish where I might not even be able to do it at all. But what's really important is that I, um, is that I try to meet the expectations that everyone has laid out because 
a teacher really does have to have a set of expectations. It's out of their control. So regardless of how frustrated I can get with the teacher, it's important really that I try to comply. The third point here is fine motor skills. So as you see here, I have a picture of a, I have a picture of a, me typing on a computer. Um, I have to use a computer for all my classes. That's actually the computer I'm, vo I'm viewing this session on right now. I bring this computer to my classes and I take all my notes on it. And this is basically my main hub for doing homework and uh, doing assignments in class. So when a teach this is going also go back this also goes back to um it also goes back to uh, accepting authority because when a teacher has an issue with me using the computer or I forget to print something out, which is very possible because of my short term memory, and it it's definitely a liability to And um, writing is really a huge difficulty for me sometimes. Uh, my handwriting is horrendous, and um, I really don't write as fast as I would when I type. So in a situation where we would be taking notes, um, if I'm writing something down on a pad and paper, um, I'm not going to catch everything. So... If I'm writing, I'll be writing the last slide. I'll be finishing the last slide of notes, and everyone else will be finishing the next slide of notes. And then when they move on to that, the slide of notes after that, I'll be on the slide of notes before that. Or sometimes I'll miss a slide altogether, and that really is a huge is a huge obstacle for me when it comes to studying and it comes to organizing what I have. So. One of the a barrier that's even bigger is the social barrier, and the three points I want to discuss with the social aspect of Asperger's is the body language, communication, the emotional sensitivity that I have in a situation, and feeling like I fit in with my peers. The first thing we're going to talk about is body language. One of the main things that's really hard for me is a conversation. I really, it's really a huge thing for me to have a conversation. Um, my mother mentioned earlier about scripting conversations. Um, that's definitely a strategy I employ when I talk to people. Even, even some of my closest friends sometimes I have to use a script. Hey Mike, how you doing? How you been? And, these are things that I have that I use sometimes, and it's not as bad for me because I've learned over over time how to manage conversations and how to deal with people. But sometimes, you know, it comes back to using it comes back to using um like verbal cues and verbal scripts in order to have an effective conversation because Sometimes it's harder for me to communicate by body language or by eye contact, which is another which is another difficulty that I have. It's important for me to verbally explain things that would normally be explained in other ways or to verbally explain to some people, obviously my closer friends, that I can be awkward in a conversation sometimes so that way they don't take my conversational awkwardness as um as a reason to as a reason to you know be put off by me i don't want to put off anyone i'm trying my best to have a conversation but sometimes it's not very easy for them to understand me which gets into the next point i mentioned this earlier when it came to when it came to executive functioning um I'm really effective at understanding other people's points and what they're trying to tell me. And I know how people would normally re react, but when I go to react to what someone has to say, I really have a huge issue trying to put out the message. 
and I know right now it might not seem like I have a difficulty talking to all of you, but when I'm having a one-on-one conversation with someone, it's, it's really a hard thing. Um, when I'm in an uncomfortable situation, it's a lot harder than when I'm in a comfortable situation. So if I'm talking to a group of friends that I've known for a really long time, it's a lot easier to have a conversation with them, especially with a group of them, than with a group of people that I really don't know and that I'm trying to get to know, especially if I want to establish a relationship with someone, whether that be friendship or whether that be having a girlfriend. It, I really need to focus on... I really need to focus on... Uh, emphasizing that with people. It's really um, it's really a hard thing for me and sometimes it's really confusing because like I said I'm really good at understanding other people but sometimes I'm so good to the point where it's confusing and I feel like I'm getting mixed signals. So I'm seeing some stuff go on and I then I see other things go on and it's really confusing. So I'm thinking, I'm overthinking about all this in my head, and I'm still expected to have a conversation at the same time. So it's really hard for me, and it's really confusing for me to have to deal with that thought process all the time, and sometimes it causes anxiety. So one of the, another main thing, and it kind of has to do with conversations, is feeling like I fit in. Um, one thing is, I really, the way I speak sometimes, especially with my vocabulary and with certain um, certain things that I say or how I phrase them, is kind of unorthodox to some people. So sometimes I have to regulate how I speak and how fast I speak and the words I use in order to have a conversation because if I'm just there like whipping out huge words and like talking really fast, people are going to, I feel that people are going to be intimidated by that and they're going to be put off by that signal that I'm putting out there. And that's definitely not something I want, that's definitely not something, a message I want to convey. Another thing I have to do is I really have to force myself to meet social expectations, even if I feel like, you know, that's not something that I would do or it's out of my character. It's important that I laugh at a joke that's not funny sometimes. I hang out with a bunch of people I really don't want to hang out with sometimes. To complain about something that I really wouldn't normally complain about. And just to kind of put myself in their shoes in order for them to kind of understand what it's like in my shoes. Because it's definitely a a hard thing to balance being myself and fitting in. Um, It's hard for me to understand social cues from other people sometimes. Like, people people might say something implying me or asking me to do something, and I might just completely miss it. And it's really important that if I want to establish a relationship with someone that I don't, that I pay attention to what they have to say and what it is they're trying to get me to do when they say something or they make a certain motion or they make certain gestures or whatever. And those are things that um, are really a huge part of, uh, that are really a huge part of my being a, uh, me being social with other people. Um, another thing is when I, when I think I'm, being social, when I think I'm trying to put a message out there, people aren't, um, I feel that people, and I know that people, sometimes don't necessarily get what I'm trying to say to them or the message I'm trying to send. And that's another anxiety that I really have to, um, that I have to accommodate for when I'm trying to fit in with others. The last thing is emotional sensitivity. And as you probably noticed by now, all three of these things kind of tie in with each other. But um, all these things that I've discovered that I've discussed that I've discussed, excuse me, pre- previously, 
is that all these things can cause fear, anxiety, and um, an issue and an issue when I'm thinking about having a conversation. Um, this anxiety and this fear is something I have to deal with every day when I have a conversation, and it's something I have to kind of I have to go through the motions of it. And it gets easier, like I said, depending on who I'm talking to and who I'm trying to deal with. But sometimes the emotional sensitivity, especially things like fear and anxiety and change when people change, like when when people change their routine or when people when something about their speech pattern changes or when something about their behavior changes, that can be a cause of anxiety. Um, and those things... And those things are really, um, are really, uh, are really hard for me. Um, in a conversation, sometimes when people say something like joking around, I'm probably, I usually am going to take it personally. So if someone's being sarcastic or if someone makes kind of a mean joke, I'm definitely going to take that personally if the joke is towards me. So sometimes I have to. Th- you know, make an extra double check and think about and think about how um and think about whether they really mean what they're saying to me or whether they're just joking around. So this is another part that's going to focus more on the sensory part of me about like some idiosyncrasies, some sensory issues that have to do with like you know touch, taste, smell, the five senses and the sp- some special interests that I have. So the first thing we're going to talk about is sensory. And um, I don't know if you all know this movie. This movie is The Matrix. And in The Matrix, the main character is Neo. The Matrix is one of my favorite movies. The main character is Neo. And long story short, he's like he's a person that can take advantage of the world around him after a lot of training. And what he does here is he's stopping bullets. And um, in a in a sensory situation, in a situation where there's a lot of high sensory stimulation, there's um, everything is like a bullet coming at you. Every like a parade, for example, every loud for me parades are a huge thing. Huge sound, loud sounds, bright lights, um, things like this all are things that are coming at me. And, you know, I wish I could be like Neo and stop all those bullets, you know, stop them just so I can have a chance to think about them and, you know, assess the situation. But unfortunately, I'm not Neo, and that's not how things go. So it's definitely something I have to deal with, and it's not something that's going to go away. The next thing is idiosyncrasies. Weird things that I do pro- include, like, tapping and noises and humming. Like, I'll be in the middle of a class, and I'll be tapping a drum beat and, from, like, one of my favorite songs or something, and people turn around and be like, Ryan, shut up. I'm trying to pay attention. Like, you can't do that. And teachers sometimes will even call me out, like, you know, are you done with your drum solo? Like... And here I have underlined idiosyncrasies, um, emphasis on the crazies. These things might make me look weird. When I gave this presentation in, per- in person, when my mom was, pre- was presenting, I was in the corner rocking and tapping on the walls, and I kind of had to explain about that when I was on stage. And um, it's, it's um, usually the idiosyncrasies are a way. Um, are a way of dealing with sensory, our way of dealing with sensory stimulation, and dealing with the output of uh, sensory stuff. So here are some of my special interests. Um, the top picture is the Elder Scrolls, and I, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of a game called Skyrim, but um. It's part of a series called The Elder Scrolls, and I'm a huge fan of The Elder Scrolls, and uh, I could probably tell you anything about it. I love video games. 
Um, and I love anime. Right at the, the bottom picture is a picture of Full Metal Alchemist. That's my favorite anime. Um, and the rest is music. The top left-hand picture is um, a picture of my band logo. I'm in a band. Before this presentation, I was actually organizing a band practice. Um, I really love music. That's probably like the main interest out of all of these on here. Um, it's really important for me for managing uh, stress, managing anxiety levels, and it's important that I fit music and band practice into my crazy schedule. Um, and one more thing I want to emphasize is in the bottom right-hand corner, you see I Heart Rap. I've memorized over 600 rap songs, and I'm not sure if you want to. I know in the school they wanted to hear me rap, and I had to decline. But um, I assure you, my skills are very good. So now that my presentation is over, I was just wondering if any of you had any questions. If you have any questions, just submit them in the chat bar, and uh, I'll answer a few of them. Uh, um, uh, here Tom wants me to prove I can rap. Um, I'm not gonna rap for you right now. I'm sorry, but if you if you want if you want to get a measurement of uh my my rap skills, I'm not sure I'm not sure what type of music you're allowed to listen to. But if you want to hear how fast I can rap, look up a song "Look at Me Now" by Busta Rhymes. Um, another question. What helps you the most when you're feeling anxious? Um, what? Definitely music. Um, like I said, the tapping thing. There's always a song in my head, and if there's not a song in my head, I'm probably making a song in my head. Music definitely helps me deal with all the stresses of everyday life. Um, another question is, what age did I become aware of what was challenging for me? Um, I think in recent years, uh, since like seventh grade, I've definitely been starting to get a much better idea of what's hard for me. But, you know, I always kind of knew I was different from everyone else. I knew that I, I always kind of knew that I had different strengths and weaknesses than everyone else. It's just how I've gone about them that's changed. And I think over the past couple of years, I've grown a lot since being able to develop what I know about, um, my strengths and weaknesses. Um, um, did I score low in my SAT? Um, I don't take SATs. I took a PSAT at St. John's, and I'm not. I take the SATs in junior year. I'm a freshman right now. Um. The PSAT at St. John's, everyone is required to take it. There's no special ed program. Um, and I do get extended time, and I get to use a calculator on the math part. Um, these accommodations allow me to take the test effectively with, you know, my peers. Um, they, don't t they don't give me a score for the PSATs, but um, they give you, a, like, a general idea of how well you did. And... I did basically average it the math section was really my low part and my um language section was really really high. Um when do I tell acquaintances about my Asperger's? Uh, I don't usually go out of I don't go out of my way. I mean, if it comes up that I need to explain to them, look guys, I'm awkward uh, or you know, I don't normally feel comfortable in this situation, or it's you, but when I explain things like that, it usually has to do with, um, it usually has to do with, uh, um, excuse me, with, um, 
like really good groups of friends. So like really good friends, I usually explain to them, uh, I usually explain to them my awkwardness and, you know, what having Asperger's is like. But a lot of my best friends grew up with me, and I'm not going to lie, a lot of my friends are probably on Spectrum anyway, which is probably what helps me relate to them. So they get what's going on already, usually. So that's a plus. And I find that kids on Spectrum tend to group together. Do I play Minecraft? Um, I've played Minecraft. I have Minecraft on my computer. It's okay. I do kind of get a little bored of it. But that's just my opinion. Um, here it says, are you a brony? Um, I'm not really sure what that means. If you could elaborate on that, I'll definitely answer the question. Does anyone in my school know I have Asperger's syndrome? Well, it's funny. A few weeks ago, I was having a conversation at the lunch table, and there are a few questionable kids at that table, too. But, um, I was there, and I was explaining, you know, just it show up, it show up, it just happened to come up in conversation with, about that I had Asperger's, and uh, and the and this kid said to me, "I'm I'm really proud that you can admit that." And I said, uh, "I don't really understand what you mean. That's like admitting I have a brain. I don't know anything different." Um, so I mean, part of it is that it's really important that I sometimes that I tell people, and other times it's that um, you know, I don't know the difference. It's not like, you know, it's not like to me, it's not. It's only important to explain if I have to. Um, a fan of the show My Little Pony. I am no, not, I'm not a fan of the show My Little Pony. <sighs> um, does anybody else have any questions? <sighs> okay, well, thank you, everyone, for... Um for your questions and uh, for your patience in our technical difficulties. Um, I, I, I'm sorry we had some, some issues. Um, but uh, anyway, if, um, if, you know, I think there's a couple more questions coming in. If, if you want to ask for another few minutes, that would be great. Um, if you need to go, I totally understand, and I will, uh, I'll be sending you the, the material. So uh, I think we have uh, one more question that was posted, so I'm going to give you Ryan back. Um, so there's two questions here, and I'll answer those quick. Um, how are video games such as Call of Duty for people on spectrum. Um, I really think it depends on what kind of spectrum disorder is going on and how you and how someone resonates with like, you know, what they see on TV. And I mean, I play Call of Duty and I can tell the difference between reality and a video game. And, you know, it's important that it stays a game. And for me, it's just a fun thing to play with my friends. And the next the next question, um, my son is 13. He's very embarrassed and ashamed about having AS. Any feedback for him? Well, I have to say is this. There, there's no reason anyone should be embarrassed and ashamed about having AS. Uh, you you don't know anything different. I, I'm not embarrassed and ashamed of having AS. Sure, sure, it it's, sucks to be different and it sucks to work hard, but it's a good perspective to have, and it makes you different from everyone else around you, and while that might be a bad thing, it's also a good thing because you look at things differently, and you experience things differently, and you feel things and see things that no one else can ever explain or understand, and that's something that you should definitely be proud of, and something that you should definitely hold close to you for the rest of your life, and there's definitely no reason to be upset or ashamed that you have AS. Well, if I hope you all enjoyed the presentation, and um, I uh, I hope this was informative for you.
Thank you so much. And um, I will be sending out a, an evaluation so that you can um, share your feedback. And thank you so much for all the great comments. And uh, look forward to uh, seeing you in a virtual room um, in the future. Thank you so much.